When I was a kid, one of my all-time favorite places to go was Chuck E. Cheese's. The games, the pizza, the prizes, it was everything a kid could ask for. And at the heart of it all was the man, I mean, the rat himself, Mr. Charles Entertainment Cheese. And yes, that is his real name. Him and his colorful bunch of friends were all part of a band called the Munch's Make Believe Band and would sing songs and keep everybody entertained. And while I look back on those memories fondly, some people look back on their memories at Chuck E. Cheese and think, what if those characters started killing people? And that's how we got Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> Mascot Horror Games A new genre of gaming that has exploded in popularity over the last few years thanks to the advent of games like Five Nights at Freddy's. But what is a mascot horror game? Well, typically it's a game or franchise that features characters that you'd expect to find on a kid's show or something lighthearted and make them hostile entities in a horror game setting. Even if you've never played the game, you've probably at least heard of Five Nights at Freddy's. And that kind of popularity doesn't happen overnight. And as with any successful franchise, there's bound to be others that want to make their own version of it with unique twists and ideas. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to review three very popular popular mascot horror games and see if they live up to all the hype around them. I should also probably mention there's going to be massive spoilers to the games I'm talking about today, but with all that out of the way, we can dive right in. Starting with... Poppy Playtime was developed by Mob Entertainment and the first chapter was released on October 12th, 2021. You play as... a person who has traveled to this old toy factory for reasons. Yeah, something tells me this is going to be a reoccurring theme in these games. The intro mentions us needing to find the poppy room, but that's all we really have to go off of. After an old commercial advertising the poppy playtime doll, we find ourselves in the abandoned toy factory. After exploring the lobby and solving a color puzzle that took me way too long to figure out, we find a hand tool that allows us to fire a metal hand attached to a wire to grab objects and run an electrical current to power nodes in order to progress. I actually thought this was a really cool gameplay mechanic. It kind of functions like a grappling hook, but it pulls objects towards you rather than you towards them. And I do like how the bigger objects take a lot longer to pull towards you, like they have some real weight to them. Once we're inside, we finally meet our main antagonist, Huggy Wuggy himself. And man, this thing is creepy. He gives off such an unsettling dead-eyed stare as he just stands there, waiting for you to give him a high five just standing there, waiting, watching. You try to leave the atrium, but the power goes out, so you're forced to turn it back on, but the doors are locked. Now where could that pesky key be? Oh, it's right there, in Huggy's hand. Thanks. One quick wire puzzle later, and we're on our way back out into the atrium, only to find out that Huggy is gone. But he isn't too far away. We then continue deeper in the factory. We find batteries to open a door, and we get a second hand for us to use for our hand unit. After that, we crawl through some vents and solve another wire puzzle as we make our way to the Make a Friend machine. This giant machine has the ability to make toys without needing any workers at all. After some lore about the founder of the company and another wire puzzle, it's time for us to assemble a toy, which is honestly pretty disappointing. I thought I'd be more involved in making the toy, but no, you just pull a few levers at the beginning and then wait for the machine to do all the work. Thanks, automation. Once we have our toy, we open the next door and proceed onward, only to be attacked by Huggy Wuggy. Unless you're like me and you space out when he first appears and he just gently pushes you out the door before killing you. One quick death later, I was now focused and ready to run from this monster only to find myself in the most frustrating part of the entire game. See, you have to run through a series of vents while being chased by Huggy, but these stupid vents were so confusing to navigate and I kept getting killed before even realizing where to go. All the tension and drama was gone after my fifth death and instead of looking at all the scary stuff going on around me, I just kept focusing on memorizing the path through the maze. I was so focused that I didn't even realize I defeated Huggy and crushed him with a box. I thought he just stopped following me, but no, I actually defeated him. 
I get they were trying to go for a claustrophobic style chase. I mean, the chapter is called A Tight Squeeze, and I was pretty impressed with the environment and the atmosphere of the game, but to have it all get ruined in this chase scene was disappointing. After the chase, we find ourselves outside the poppy room, and we also find a mysterious tape talking about something called Experiment 1006, the prototype, with a creepy image of an arm on the monitor. While the tape doesn't tell us much, I'm guessing he's going to be the big bad behind all the bad stuff going on in the factory. After we watch the tape, we enter the poppy room and find what looks like a really old house from the 60s. We walk through it before finding Poppy in a glass case. We open the case, Poppy's eyes open, and then that's the end of chapter 1. While the chapter was super short, I did like what I played aside from the vent chase. The atmosphere is really good and I really did like the environment. I think the only other real complaint I had is that it feels like it's leaning too much into the secret lore for people to discover direction. And while I really do like those kind of stories, I was kind of hoping to get a bit more information about who we are, why we're going to this factory, and what our goal is. I'm guessing we're here to save the other employees based on a message we see at the beginning of the game, but how would they still be alive after 10 years? It's unclear, and while I want to know more, I'm also not up for scouring every inch of this place to find the one piece of paper that contains the one piece of lore that I'm missing. Especially since this is only chapter 1, and I really don't think we're going to get any big reveals this early on. Overall, this was a pretty good game. I might even give chapter 2 a try in the future. Garden of Banban Ban was developed by the Euphoric Brothers and the first chapter was released on January 6, 2023. You play as a person who has traveled to a facility for reasons Seriously, would it really be so bad if I at least knew my name? From what I gathered from the intro, we're going to a place called the Ban Ban Kindergarten, and with the intro focusing on the importance of time when searching for missing children, I assume we're a parent looking for a missing kid. In the game, we search for key cards to progress through the facility while being stalked by horrible monsters. Well, one monster anyway. Yeah, despite showing images of monsters all over the facility, we only see one of them, and it's this weird bird thing. I'm guessing if I want to see the rest of them, I'll need to buy the other chapters. While some people might look at this game and think it looks terrible, I did find a certain charm in how unsettling everything looked. And unsettling really is the word I'd use to describe my experience with this game. I never really knew what to expect next. Like when I noticed the giant bird was stalking me before it ran into a dark room, I figured once I turned the lights on it would either be gone or I'd find something gory, but no, it's just sitting there in a playground waiting for me to feed it some eggs. Already strange enough, but after I finish feeding it, it barfs out a key card and then sends me on my way. Then, towards the end of the game, the bird comes back, but this time it actually is trying to kill me. This game follows no real logic, and it left me with an unsettling feeling the entire time because I never knew what was going to happen next. For all I knew, the bird was going to come back, but challenge me to a one-on-one -on -one basketball game. But as amazing of a final showdown as that would have been, the real ending consists of us pushing a button, running along a path while being chased, pushing another button, and that's it. Unless you're like me, and you try running towards the exit, only to find there's an invisible wall in the way. Instead of doing something like, I don't know, closing the door so I don't think I can go through it during the chase? I don't want to call this game lazy, because a lot of work goes into making video games, but this one really feels phoned in. Several of the rooms are just four blank walls with some chairs and desks thrown in, and it feels so soulless. The entire map feels like we're the first person to ever set foot in this location because it's so clean and sterile, and all the assets feel like they're just dropped in wherever to fill space. I mean, look at the playground we spent half the chapter in. There's a jungle gym, a swing set, the exact same copy and pasted tree like four times, a log, a canoe, and our bird friend. There's also no textures or details in this environment. It's as bare bones as can be. With everything being so minimalist, I figured I'd be playing for a while, since there wasn't much work done on the environment, or the graphics, or the story, but no. I finished the entire thing in less than 30 minutes. This barely felt like a game, more like the demo game publishers used to make for games where you'd play the first part of it to decide if you wanted to actually purchase it or not. It just felt so unfinished, like they got a working prototype for a game and decided, eh, good enough, let's ship it. 
What makes it worse is they're doing it in chapters like other indie games, but they've already released three other chapters in the same year. It just doesn't give me the confidence that there's a lot of work put into each chapter if they all ended up like this one. Which, while this one was free, I don't really want to buy the others if they're going to be this short and devoid of content. After this experience, I really don't want to give any of the other chapters a try. Amanda the Adventure is a horror game that was first released on itch.io on April 8th, 2022 as part of the Dread XP found footage game jam. The original game was very short and consisted of the player watching three VHS tapes of an old children's cartoon called Amanda the Adventure. The show was similar to Dora the Explorer, where Amanda would go on an adventure and ask the viewers for help along the way. She's also accommodated by a talking sheep named Wooly. As you watch the tapes, you slowly see the world of the show become more corrupt and twisted before the ending climax where Amanda finds her way to your house and kills you. Even though the original Itch.io game was very short, it did amass a cult following and was made into a full game and released on Steam on April 25th, 2023. Some notable differences between the full release and the original game is that now you have an entire attic to explore with puzzles to solve and a lot more tapes to watch. When the game first starts, we are given a letter from our Aunt Kate telling us that we'll never see her again and that she left us something in her attic. Definitely not creepy at all. We then find ourselves in her attic, which is full of locked items and the first tape, which features Amanda and Wooly teaching us how to make an apple pie. They gave some pretty specific directions on how to bake that pie, and as soon as the tape was over, I turned around and found a toy oven and several fruits sitting on the table behind me. I followed Amanda's instructions and was given the next tape. From here on, I continued to watch tapes, follow Amanda's instructions, and complete puzzles in order to get the next one. The tapes included us going to the store so Amanda could get her friend a present, and us taking Wooly to the doctor after he's involved in an accident. I then got the fourth tape, which was about things rotting. After watching a pretty disturbing tape where Amanda plays with the dead fox, she then asks me the question if everything rots. I answered yes, and then the tape ended. Then I turn around, and the trap door to the attic swings open, and a horrific nightmare creature comes out and murders me. Clearly she did not like that answer, but I did get a sticker on the TV, so I must have found one of the bad endings. So I started over but this time I wanted to try some new things I learned from my first playthrough. I remember Wooly wanted a peach pie instead of an apple pie, so I baked him one instead. And once I did, I got a strange orange tape that was a home movie about a girl named Lauren on her birthday. Her parents are trying to get her to celebrate her birthday, but she's ignoring them to watch Amanda the Adventurer. After a short discussion, they come back into the living room only to find that their daughter is missing and the front door is wide open. And then the tape ends. After that, I continued on my playthrough, but I didn't notice too many other differences. I made it to the final choice and selected no this time instead of yes, only to be killed by the creature once again. Clearly I was missing something. After that experience, I wanted to test what would happen if I completely disobeyed Amanda's instructions and kept giving her wrong answers to her questions. Unlike my last couple of playthroughs, Amanda got very upset the more I disobeyed her. It would end up removing all the wrong choices so I had to play along. I got to the end again, and nothing new. Dang, what now? Well, there was one other thing I found. When I found the last tape, I also found a combination to a safe. So on my next playthrough, I opened the safe and I found a scrap of paper that showed me a code on the cork board and a button that went on the TV so I could pause the videos. The code had something to do with all the potted plants, but I couldn't figure out what all they did. So I left that alone for now. I also started watching all the tapes again, but pausing at certain screens to see if I missed anything. After watching through them several times, I did find a secret in the first tape that told me to set the oven to 575 degrees Fahrenheit. It also took me a bit of time to realize I needed the screen paused on the number while I adjusted the oven temperature. After I figured that out, the tape had a different ending where the kitchen caught on fire and I was tasked with making another pie with some unique ingredients. One rat pie later, I got a new tape. And this one was the most disturbing one so far. 
Up until this point, I thought Amanda was the main villain. However, in this tape, she kept calling for help and she kept crying saying that she was trapped. And it was Wooly that kept trying to get us back on track instead of Amanda. I also found a music sheet that when I played on the toy piano, I unlocked a blue tape that showed a little girl who appeared to be in an asylum attending a therapy session. After the tape, I found a coloring book puzzle that when solved gave me the code to open another box where I got a pair of scissors and a new tape. This tape took place on a farm where we were giving Amanda a tour so she can see all the different animals. However, all throughout the video we kept getting national alerts for different kinds of bad weather. I wasn't able to figure out how they all connected to the actual video yet so I pressed forward. Towards the end, Amanda finds a lost kitten who is alone and scared. She asks us if we'll help the lost kitten. I say yes and find an old spin and speak toy, but all the animals are replaced with different kinds of bad weather. I kept trying to spin it, but it kept landing on thunderstorms, so I must have missed something. I replayed the tape again, but this time I said no to helping the kitten and got treated to this. <laughs> Before dying again. I get a feeling like this is about more than helping a kitten. So after another reboot, I used the code to get the scissors and cut the head off the doll as the game hinted at in the coloring books, I found a set of batteries that powered up the toy robot. I tried entering the code I got from the store level and it seemed to work, but it looked like I needed another code to continue. I had a sneaking suspicion I needed to run through the tapes again. And it was here that I got stuck and had to look up what to do next. See, I kept writing everything down in my notebook that I thought would be a code or a clue or something and I didn't realize that I needed to pause the video on the screen where I originally got the code for the robot and enter it at the same time. But that obstacle later, I got the sequence right and found myself doing birthday cake math with candles. After a very disturbing birthday party, I got another tape where Amanda wants to perform brain surgery on Wooly despite his objections. I had to choose to help Amanda or Wooly. I chose to save Wooly and got another tape that is broken audio that gives me clues to finding a code. Hi! Trapped or treat! After solving a series of coded messages in the other tapes, I eventually get a bucket and told that I need to find a key and that it's what's on the inside that counts. I looked in the robot's back panel to find out that he cannot get wet. So I filled the bucket with water from the dripping ceiling and destroyed my robot friend to get the key to a chest. Inside I find, surprise surprise, another tape. However, this tape was different than all the others. On this one, Wooly is completely gone and it's just Amanda. When the tape starts up, we see her sitting on the couch coloring before she starts telling us the importance of sharing and some other things about herself. Towards the end of the video, she tells us that she has a secret that she wants to share with us. However, when she starts to share the secret, the TV starts going crazy. Our character drops to the ground before picking up a brick, throwing at the TV, and destroying it. Then, after the TV explodes, the rain outside stops, and the sun comes out, and credits roll. What the heck was all that? Did I just win? Did I defeat Amanda? I was so confused. What just happened? I needed to jump right back in and keep exploring to figure out what I just saw. But while I was watching the credits roll and thinking about all these things, something occurred to me. All three of these games that I played ended on a cliffhanger, but only this one managed to pique my curiosity enough that I wanted to keep playing. It's also the one I wanted to talk about the most because it was so interesting to me. The mystery was built so well into the gameplay rather than hidden in a bunch of random documents that I was expected to find and piece together on my own, and the puzzles were actually puzzles I needed to solve rather than bring X item to Y location. This felt like a game that was meant to be played as a game and not one to generate hype around a mystery and then talked about online while everybody waits for the next chapter to come out. While the environment was much smaller than the other two games, it was packed with so much more to explore. 
I came into each of these games with the same expectations, and sure, Amanda the Adventurer was the only one I had to pay for out of the three, so this might seem like an unfair comparison, but it wasn't just about my overall experience, but if I even wanted to keep playing all three games. Poppy Playtime was fun up until that ending chase, but there really wasn't anything there to keep me interested enough to buy Chapter 2. And Garden of Ban Ban was so short, it left me feeling like I'd never get my money's worth in the next installment. Amanda the Adventure, on the other hand, had me hooked before I even got my first bad ending. The presentation was so much better because I wasn't expecting a big scary monster to jump out and kill me like in the other two games. Well, yes, Amanda is creepy, there's just this level of unexpectedness where every time I found a new tape, I never knew what would be on it next. Would it be another creepy kids cartoon, a coded message, a deranged mess of horror and gore? And this game was much more satisfying when I finally solved a puzzle and was able to get an item to discover a whole new story line that I could play through. It required a lot more effort than finding a key card or finding a hidden button, and I felt much more accomplished when I was able to solve the puzzles in this game compared to the other two. I actually got so invested in solving these mysteries, I actually got out my physical notebook and started recording everything I could find so I made sure not to miss anything. If I'm being perfectly honest, I was going into these games with a bit of a cynical attitude. I see games like this all the time, where the story is just vague enough they know players will want to spend as long as possible combing over every little detail while waiting for the next installment to be the first one to solve it. And what made it worse was how the homepage of some of these games are covered in links to buy more merch, additional chapters, and other things that they want me to spend my money on. It left me with this hollow feeling that the focus was more on making a unique mascot and a game with just enough mystery and jump scares for people to react to online and discuss rather than making a game for people to sit down and actually enjoy. Enjoy. I mean sure, Five Nights at Freddy's is guilty of this too, but when they first started it was just a guy wanting to make a scary game about animatronics. But now it feels like some developers want to start at the merchandising point where they want to make something just iconic enough they can slap an image of it all over products because they know people will buy them. A cynical view I know, but it's hard to argue with how some of these games present themselves. Amanda the Adventure, however, really changed my mind about the mascot horror genre. While yes, they do sell plushies and merch, it's pretty obvious a lot of work went into the game itself and that the merch was more of an afterthought after the game received commercial success. It actually got me open to trying out more mascot horror games so I could try to find more gems like this one. Who knows, maybe in the future I will try Chapter 2 of Poppy's Playtime or Garden of Ban Ban to see if they change my opinion of them. And it's okay if you're somebody who loves these games and even bought merch to support the developers. I'm not trying to say that that's wrong to do, I'm just personally not a fan of how these games present themselves. It just feels kind of hollow, like we're going through the motions in order to create a product for people to buy rather than making something that they know people will enjoy. But if you have a different viewpoint than me, or know another horror game you'd like me to try, then let me know in the comments down below. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. See ya!